Kids that did well in school did well in French, but nobody really learned to speak French. Hi there, Steve Kaufman here. And today I want to talk about what I would do, how I would teach language in a classroom. Uh, remember, if you enjoy these videos, please subscribe, click on the bell for notifications. And uh, if you follow me on a podcast service, uh, you know, please leave a comment. I do appreciate it. So I'm going to talk about teaching language, a language in a classroom, which is something that I have essentially never done. But I'm going to begin by telling two little stories. Uh, first of all, I remember very clearly that we had a teacher in high school who was originally from the UK and this was in Montreal and uh, we were learning French. He was the French teacher. And I can remember that when we would try to speak French in class, sometimes he would preface that by saying, all right, you guys, now we're going to talk frog language, which was maybe funny and people chuckled a bit, but it really didn't inspire much enthusiasm for what we were about to attempt to do, speak French. And then the second thing I remember was when I was uh, a student in France, I had a job. I used to go twice, I think a week, I would go to a French family for lunch and I was paid and I was given a small amount and I was given a, a wonderful meal, much better than the student restaurant fare that I was used to. And my job was to speak English to the kids in the family. There were the parents were there and they had two kids. They all come home for lunch and I was invited. And so I'd finished my lunch with uh, a couple of glasses of wine that they would give me. And then I would bicycle halfway across Paris to uh, the Agricultural Institute, l'Institut, I don't know, Agricole, whatever it was. And I had to run in there and I had to start this language lab. So now we're talking about 1966, 65. Okay, that's a long time ago. And so here are all these aspiring, you know, French farmers, I guess, that were studying at the L'Institut d'Etudes de, Agricoles de, de or whatever it's called. And uh, so, and they would be listening to stuff on their, they had these tape recorders. So it was a big language lab. So there was like a big room. There were 30 people sitting at their tape recorder listening to this stuff. I can't remember what my function was other than to turn it on or if people had questions, but mostly they just sat there. And one of the guys at the back of the class, he took his big earphones off, he slammed them down on his desk, and he said, Merde, ça fait dix ans que j'apprends l'anglais et je ne comprends rien. In other words, I've been studying French or English for 10 years and I still don't understand anything. So that, again, I remember that quite vividly because it, it made me laugh. I remember that they had stuff in the text that they were listening to terms that I didn't even know in English, like stubble mulch, stubble mulch tillage, I remember, stubble mulch tillage. So that's kind of my experience with the classroom. And I, I would say that in, um, in high school or in elementary school, the French was most uninteresting. And, uh, you know, kids that did well in school did well in French, but nobody really learned to speak French. Uh, when I got to university, I've mentioned before, I had this Dr. Maurice Rabotin, who was a great professor, who got me motivated to learn French, really inspired me to learn French. And then my French learning took off. So if I were a teacher, uh, if I envision the classroom, so you can have a situation where the teacher is a native speaker. You can have a situation where the teacher is not a native speaker, but speaks the language that he or she is teaching well. You can have a situation where the teacher doesn't speak that language well, and you could even have a situation where the teacher doesn't speak the language at all. Today, in the modern world of the internet and MP3 and so forth and so on, I don't think it really matters whether the teacher uh, is fluent speaker of the language or not. Better if he or she is. I think better if he or she is a native speaker, because I think that is it's more inspirational for the learner that they're learning the language from the person who has that culture, that language in them, but it's not a condition. And there are so many opportunities for the learner to hear the language. First of all, obviously to read anything they want to read in the language and also to hear the language via MP3 files, to discover content of interest, even to connect with tutors, and rooms could be organized, not like that language lab 
uh, situation in France in 1965, but where you, people could have direct contact with tutors in, in the language that they're learning. So the teacher needn't provide that, the language. The teacher, to my mind, is first and foremost is a motivator, like Maurice Rabotin motivated me to learn French with tremendous consequences because I went to France, I became fluent in French, I acquired that confidence that I can learn languages. So he had a tremendous impact on my life. But a teacher, you know, obviously, because Mr. Rabotin was French, that was part of what inspired me. But I think a very good teacher, very encouraging teacher can stimulate students and inspire them and help them, even if the language that the student is trying to learn is not the native language of the teacher. I think we need to look at the language classroom. Like if, if it were me, I would encourage, I would encourage my students to listen and read, obviously. Uh, I would encourage them to use link. Uh, if I were a teacher in a classroom, I could have 25 kids and I could set aside, you know, a range of content, 20 stories that I know are suitable for them from a number of different perspectives and they can choose whichever one they want. And I would be able to follow how active they are, how much they're reading, how much they're listening, how many link links they're creating, how much they're writing. Uh, I could organize for them to talk to, like if I'm a native speaker, fine. If I'm not, or if I'm not very fluent in that language, I can arrange for them twice a week to have online contacts or maybe a small group of them to have online contacts with uh, a teacher, a native speaker from the country and they could talk about things uh, about the country or about whatever the students are uh, reading and listening to. And I wouldn't have to create content all the time. I wouldn't have to create lessons. I wouldn't have to prepare. Like a lot of teachers spend a lot of time preparing their lessons. Uh, I could follow exactly what they're doing. Also, I wouldn't test them. I would rely on keeping track of how active they are. Because I, as I've said before many times, what matters is how active are they with the language? Some are going to do better than others. I don't want to discourage the ones that are, you know, don't pronounce as well or don't, you, they don't seem to do as well for whatever reason, they might start doing better later on. So if they're struggling at an early stage, why would I discourage them? Rather, I would want to control, I want to see how active they are. And if they're not very active, how do I make them more active? Is it because the content is of no interest to them? Uh, I'd have to try to find out with each of these students, if possible, it's not always possible, how do I motivate them to become more active? The goal is to make them more active. And so once you accept that the teacher doesn't have to bring the language to the student, so the teacher doesn't have to be native, doesn't even have to be proficient in the language, it now opens up the possibility that many more schools can offer languages which they now don't offer because they don't have an accredited teacher in that language. So you could offer five languages in the classroom and encourage them to go off and study or even sit in the classroom and listen and read right there in the classroom. Uh, if the classroom is only in one language, of course, we can have conversations in the classroom and the kids can talk about what they have been reading and uh, they can even talk about words that they've been saving that they don't fully understand and other kids can comment on what they think the word means and how it's used and we can have examples of how that word is used. If everyone is studying the same language, it's much easier. Uh, however, if in fact some people in that classroom, you know, don't want to study French and I've said before in Canada, you know, it's like your civic obligation to, to the patriotic obligation. If you're an English speaker, you got to learn French, but maybe the kid doesn't want to learn French, but maybe he wants to learn Spanish or he wants to learn Chinese or Russian. So then if we can set it up so that maybe out of 25 kids, 15 are going to do French, but another 10 are going to study other languages of interest to them. And we set it up so that they can do that. And then, of course, we have to come up with activities in the classroom, which at the very least can be listening and reading. The difficulty is if there's so many different languages, then some of these activities would have to be, again, solitary, uh, such as this uh, putting the sentences back together again that I'm now doing in beta uh, at link. And we might devise other activities for the kids. Obviously, it's easier if everyone is studying the same language, not ideal if you have uh, different languages, but then we have to compare that to the alternative, which is to 
sort of force people to learn a language that they're not interested in learning. Uh, because motivation is such a, an important part of language learning. It was the case with me. I think it's the case with most learners. And we see the example in the Canadian English language school system where unmotivated kids learning French, in fact, don't learn French. So I think we have to strike a balance. So it may not be, be ideal. But again, I'll be the first to admit that these ideas may not be practical. But um, I throw those out there as ideas. If we look at where language instruction was in the 60s when I was learning French at school, or even when I was, or in the 50s I was learning French at school, or in the 60s when I was with these uh, students learning, you know, at the L'Institut Agricole in, in France. So many things have changed. The internet, MP3 technology, and a whole bunch of other uh, technologies and resources, language resources, and so forth. So maybe the way languages are taught in schools will continue to evolve and perhaps some of the ideas that I've mentioned here may have some relevance uh, for the classroom. And I will leave you with uh, two older videos where I talk about the classroom and individual learning uh, and you'll see that uh, maybe some of my ideas have evolved over time. So thank you very much for listening. Bye.